Welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently all participants are in a listen only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I'd like to turn the call over to your host for today, Wendy Peebles. Good afternoon and thank you, Lisa. I'm Wendy Peebles, Lead Outreach Coordinator, the Census Bureau Economic Management Division. I am delighted that you have joined today's webinar. This is a collaboration with our federal trade partners, the State Department and the Bureau of Industry and Security, and they have an informative webinar plan. A few points before we begin, questions and answers will occur at the end via the chat. Please send your questions to all panelists. We will address as many questions as we can, and the contact information of the agencies will be provided for further follow-up. Please do not send any sensitive or confidential information in the chat. The transcript, presentation, and recording will be available about seven to 10 business days following the webinar and will be posted to the Census Academy website and the State Department's website. We also ask that you complete the evaluation. That is very important. We want to hear back from you to let us know how we did today, and it helps us in providing future content. And before we begin, I'd just like to share a little information about a resource tool that the Census Bureau offers. As you may be aware, the Census Bureau is the official source for U.S. export and import statistics and regulations governing the reporting of exports from the U.S. to other countries. The Census Bureau provides extensive outreach and education to its customers on understanding the foreign trade regulations, classifying commodities, using the automated export system, and utilizing the trade data. U.S. Trade Online, as you see here on the slide, allows users to obtain monthly and annual trade statistics at the district and import level, as well as state exports and imports. For more information, please visit the website www.census.gov forward slash trade or call our International Trade Helpline at 800-549-0595. Data tools are provided as free services by the Census Bureau and are dynamic tools that gives users access to the most current U.S. international trade data. In addition to trade data, we also provide a wide range of domestic data, such as payroll, establishments, expenditures, and much more in the manufacturing industry. So please visit usatrade.census.gov to access current and historical data on USA Trade Online or explore Census Global Market Finder to help identify potential target markets for you. You can access the latter by typing Census Global Market Finder into your internet search engine. Both are great trade tools that can assist you with exporting um, your business and assist you with planning. So just wanted to share with you um, a resource that will support your export process. And I think we are ready to begin with the subject matter of the day, and I'm gonna pass it on to Renee. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to the Census Bureau for hosting today's webinar. Uh, my name is Renee Colores. I'm on the IT modernization team at the U.S. Department of State's Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. We have a very exciting webinar for you all today, and so we want to thank you all for joining. Uh, you'll be hearing today from uh, the Director of Defense Trade Controls, as well as the uh, U.S. Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security. And so a little bit about our speakers uh, from DDTC, you'll hear from Karen Reggae, who's our Chief Information Officer, as well as Charlie Liebetrau and myself, who support the IT modernization team. And then on from our colleagues at BIS, we'll be hearing from Michael Palmer, who is the Chief Experience Officer and Associate Chief Information Officer, as well as, as, well as Alex Chimponda and Annie Person, who support the Business Technology Solutions team. And so a little bit about what we'll be discussing today. Uh, we'll start off with DDTC's recent IT updates and some DEX enhancements, and then we'll hand it over to BIS to talk about their future IT roadmap and what's coming. Um, and then we'll have some discussion um, between our two organizations on how we're collaborating, what that looks like, what that means for users, um, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. So as Wendy said, Please feel free to, throughout the presentation, include your, com your comments, questions in the chat. We'll be pulling those and saving them for the Q&A session. And so I'm going to hand it over to Karen Reggae to kick it off. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Renee, and thank you all for joining. 
Um, it's really good to be here to talk a little bit about what we've been up to, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in 2023 and beyond. So to start out with, um, one of the things that that really took a lot of time um, in the DDTC IT modernization area was um, the ITAR reorganization. Um, we had some rule changes, um, really a precursor to future rule changes. And so there were a lot of citations that we needed to update in both in, in two different places, really, in the DEC system and also all over the website, as you might imagine. Um, and in June of 2022, we had a massive update to our licensing, our external licensing, um, the framework and, and the, the user interface. And so we had um, a number of um, industry participants actually test um, that new system for licensing. And that really is foundational to some of the other changes that we want to make coming up in 2023 that I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. So a lot of our time really was focused on um, this, reor this reorganization rule. It, it was published in March 2022. It was put into effect, the, the effective date of those regulations was September 6th. So in June, we did this licensing sort of reboot, this new UI uh, user interface um, for licensing. And in that, we switched over to having kind of a form view into basically having just a PDF um, view of any submitted applications. And what this allows for us, of course, is an easy way of version control. Um, because, you know, as we learned from all the different changes in the ITAR, you know, we need to have um, versions of our forms um, and, and we need them to be available, you know, exactly what you submitted when you submitted it. Um, and so that was a big change for us. Um, so, and, and we're working really closely with our policy uh, office in the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls uh, to make sure that we are um, staying in line with any future updates, which which are being planned um, at this point and have been talked about um, in, in different uh, venues over the last year or so, some of the other additional changes that are going to be made to the ITAR. So um, we can change slides. All right, so some of the things that we did, um, I mean, we did a lot of work on some internal um, systems in 2022, but um, in terms of what, what might have impacted you as users of the system, external users, um, you know, we did some changes to DEX um, as part of the, the platform. We implemented registration notifications, you know, which basically, you know, were emails that are sent out as you go through the registration process of, of, you know, sort of where things are and when it's time to pay and all of those sorts of things. So, so that was um, an initiative that we completed in 2022. Um, and that was something that, that users had requested and, and also they want to see that in licensing um, so that, you know, there's more uh, com communication between um, us as the regulator and you as the industry as you go through the process of either registering or applying for a license. Um, we also engaged the user um, community, as I mentioned, in user acceptance testing, and we're planning to do that again this year for different things that we're going to be doing, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we revamped our DEX um, self-service, and we also instituted a customer service uh, customer survey um, through GSA, so that we can get feedback on how our response team and help desks are performing and how things are going um, on our customer support lines. Uh, we added um, the ability uh, early on um, after we deployed DEX for. Uh, industry participants to copy a license. And we're looking at uh, another enhancement that's sort of related to this, a way to actually upload a data file for um, different commodities, you know, because some some licenses, of course, have, have multiple, um, you know, multiple commodities, sometimes tens, hundreds, I don't know about thousands, but, you know, I've, I've heard instances where there's 500 
um, you know, different parties, for example, to a license. And so just easier ways um, for all of our licensing applications, including um, the DSP-5-6 and all of those, but also um, the 6004 and, and the 85 application. So, so we're looking at sort of expanding the use of, of simpler ways of actually interacting with us so that things um, can be done more efficiently and it doesn't take so much time. And that copying of a license was, was something that was requested early on that we did already deploy. Um, we're also um, uh, looking at a number of different uh, future enhancements, um, and right now we'll go through some of that. Uh, one of the big things that we're going to be focusing on in 2023 is really um, the authentication piece, and and we want to add um, CAC card PIV authentication. There's a lot of um, industry participants that have access um, to uh, government federated um, identity cards, and, and we want to be able to use that um, as, as a way of authentication um, since you're going to be using it for other purposes. We want to also be able to allow for a single account for all third parties. So we have um, you know, a really big problem right now where third parties that are supporting industry are having to have multiple emails, um, an email, an individual email for each and every one of their clients. And we wanna change the way that works so that it's much easier for uh, those third parties to interact with DEX, uh, but yet it still has the security in making sure that that all the data is secure to those individual companies whose data it is. Um, we want to establish um, a DEX organization um, for non-registered entities, and this this has to do with um, you know only our registered entities actually um, are considered you know, a DEX organization. Everyone else is sort of considered an individual, whether they work for a company or not. And so we want to add the capability to allow non-registered entities to really be an organization and have um, a corporate administrator and be able to track all the applications that are coming from that organization, even though it's not a registered entity as defined by the ITAR. And then um, additionally, we're looking at um, identity proofing. And, and while we have this for licensing with our digital certs, um, you know, we're looking for ways of, of, you know, using different technologies for, or, or using a technology that would allow us for our retransfer applications, the 6004, where we would be able to, um, you know, prove the identity of, of the individual who's submitting those applications. So that's that's kind of a big. There's a lot to that. Um, the other thing I should mention about that is that, you know, we are we are using Okta, and and we're going to be um, using a new instance of Okta um, while we make all of these different changes, and it's going to require some work on the industry's part to uh, to redo their um, their MFA. And so um, that's something that's going to be happening in 2023, and we're setting up the support systems to be able to handle um, those questions that come up and 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 the support uh, inquiries that that will ultimately come up from that from that change. So uh, the other the other um, few things that we're looking at doing in 2023 is um, our API interface modernization that would, you know, we would start to look at um, identifying, you know, the formats and so on for our um, our automated programming interfaces. Um, and that would uh, not initially replace our current batch filing, but, you know, we, we would like to modernize um, and and be more inclusive of, of our forms and not just have it be of submissions, but also have the API available for the return. So in other words, when you get the license, you could you could get that through an API interface. Um, and so so that's one of the the big priorities that we want to um, begin in 2023. Um, we also pulled down the web-based decision tools that we had um, when we 
on September 6th when we did um, the re the ITAR reorg because you know they were outdated already and with the ITAR um, changes they were even more outdated and so we plan to re-release um, those on our website to allow users to be able to use those tools um, and and we find that they're that they're very helpful for some individuals and so we want to put those back up on the website. Um, we're going to be continuing to update and redesign the DDTC's public website. Um, we started that project in 2022 and we're going to continue that. We want to release um, some additional user requested enhancements to our registration and licensing. Um, for example, as I mentioned, we want to implement the notifications um, index licensing. Uh, which we did in, you know, for the registration process. And then finally, we want to finalize um, uh, the development of the voluntary disclosures application, which currently is not yet online, and we hope to have that online um, in the coming year. All right, so these are some upcoming opportunities to connect. Um, we have a news and events page on the pmddtc.state.gov website. And so that's a really good place um, to look. We also send emails out when we're gonna do events. Um, we are gonna be um, putting out something very uh, fairly soon um, in January on the 2023 DEX user group. So you should check our website announcement to volunteer as a DEX user group member for 2023. This is this will be our third year of the DEX user group and it's very well organized um, thanks to my communications uh, team. And, and I think it's really worthwhile if it's something that you have a little extra bandwidth and are interested in what we're doing and helping us to test and providing us with uh, feedback. And then finally, we have um, an email team mailbox um, for questions or comments or feedback um, that you're more than welcome to use. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael Palmer at BIS, and he'll tell you about um, what's going on over there. Yeah, Karen, we were so excited when you mentioned this session and being involved. And thank you to the census team for allowing us to connect with this community. Um, hi, my name is Michael Palmer. I'm the Chief Experience Officer and uh, Associate CIO. I wear a couple of hats over here at BIS. Uh, one of the other hats I also wear is I'm in charge of the development team uh, that also includes modernization for all of our systems, most of which are 10 to 20 years old. And so um, that includes infrastructure, that includes the way our data is structured, that includes um, also our website. And so we have a lot to tackle. Um, so over the last year, year and a half uh, when I arrived, about a year and a half ago before I was at DHS and the U.S. Digital Service at the White House, um, we had to assess kind of how do we tackle this in terms of a roadmap to get us to where we can actually start building modern, modernized uh, digital products for you, the community, uh, to really benefit from. And I've been seeing some questions in the in the chat that I'm excited to get to at the end. Uh, so over the last year, we really tack started to tackle uh, infrastructure as well as doing some pilot projects when it comes to data and data sharing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with Karen in, in a little bit. In terms of applications, it's very similar. We're very similar in terms of uh, uh, what we have to what Karen's uh, uh, experience has been probably two to three years ago. And so we are trailing Karen's team by two to three years. So we're benefiting greatly from speaking with them and and using the lessons learned from, from their journey, as well as the features that they're adding now, how they're connecting with communities, uh, the change management process that goes into this, not only internally, but also inter externally and how to manage that effectively uh, with, with user communities, both internal and external. And so uh, our three major assets that we're looking to tackle um, coming up are the website, which is where a lot of folks go to do research, as you know, uh, and uh, SnapR, which some of you have mentioned in the questions so far, um, the export license submission process, uh, process and, and that system. And then our uh, case management system, which is used by our export enforcement officers to investigate cases of people trying to get around the export control process. And so those are, are the three major uh, items on our, on our, uh, 
in our roadmap, and we haven't really we haven't nailed down uh, timelines and sequencing yet for those items. But we are jumping headfirst into doing user research, and we're going to talk a little bit about that right after this with Annie Person. Uh, we've jumped right into user research starting last spring, mostly with feds, and we're also bringing in contractor staff like Karen has to support user research, which will be the foundation for us building these new experiences and applications uh, that that you're going to take advantage of. Uh, so on that note, I think I'm going to pass it. I think the next slide is uh, related to user research, so I'm going to pass it to Annie Person and then after her. You can have, uh, we're going to have Alec Chimpanda talk a little bit about some of the results of our existing user research that we just did uh, in a small snapshot this past summer. So, Annie. Thank you, Mike. So, when we talk about collaboration and modernizing our high priority systems, there's really one important factor in all of that. And I want to call it out. And what that is, is that is you. You are the ones who are using our products and services on a daily basis. And you're the ones who are most impacted by any changes that we make, small or large. And I guess another way that you can think about it is that this is your world and we're really just orbiting. And so to make sure that your needs are heard and reflected in all of the work that we do, we kicked off BIS Connect uh, last or this year at June, in June at the Exporters Conference. And what is BIS Connect? So BIS Connect is our research program where we reach out and we connect with you to learn and understand and to listen to what your needs are and how can we improve our products and services to better serve and meet those needs. So already this year, we have conducted a series of interviews and we're gonna continue to conduct more interviews into next year and beyond because the perfect design and the perfect experience, it's going to require an ongoing commitment from us to you to make sure that you are being heard. And so with all of that said, um, if you are interested in having your voice influence and shape the direction of the improvements that we are making, uh, please take a screenshot of the email down below and also in the chat, we're going to provide you a link so that you can also sign up and participate in our research activities. And then we will follow up with you immediately and we will keep the conversation going and bring you along in this journey with us. And so with that said, I am going to now pass it on to my colleague, Alec, who is an expert in all things related to our mission. And he's gonna give you a snapshot view into some of the insights that we've captured already um, from our existing research. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Mike. Um, and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction there. You know, might be exaggerating a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, again, I'm Alex Chimpond. I'm a project manager with uh, BIS. I've been B with BIS OCIO Business Technology uh, Solutions Team. Um, I've been with uh, BIS for about uh, 12 years now. Um, and I'm in charge of the production application suite, including the SnapR application, which many of you might be familiar with or are familiar with. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, some of the customer pain points. And, uh, you know, basically this is information that we've gathered from research, as Annie pointed out, uh, including our recent uh, BIS export conference this past June, um, customer focus sessions, uh, which they've had with uh, some volunteers. And thank, thank you to all those who have volunteered and participated. And thanks uh, Jane and Annie from my team uh, for organizing and supporting those. Um, and also from feedback that we've gotten from uh, BIS support teams. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about, what I'm not gonna talk about is some of the good comments that you guys have provided as well. You know, so we, we have had some good uh, feedback in terms of positives uh, that you see with uh, uh, the SnapR and, and other BIS applications that you interact with. Uh, so with that, let's talk uh, through the five bullets that I have here. There's really no particular order. There's no prioritization associated with them. Um, you know, I just put them up there. So first off, uh, let's talk about the password uh, reset, um, you know, and how you guys interact with that today. Uh, today, uh, customers set up questions that they can answer. Uh, not everyone has done that, but we do encourage all users to uh, set up their, uh, their their questions and answers so they can uh, do their own self uh, resetting for uh, if they get locked out of out of the uh, 
uh, system. Um, additionally, company administrators can reset their passwords. Uh, however, what we're, what we're finding within BIS is that uh, there are still a number of customers that are calling on a regular basis asking our help desk to assist them with uh, password reset. So what we're going to, so what we're doing to address that is kind of looking at other industry standards out there, um, looking at things like login.gov, Okta, which some of you are familiar with, uh, or many of you are familiar with, I should say, and uh, other uh, platform agnostic initiatives. Uh, like there's some cross-platform initiatives that are going on around uh, pass keys that'll be coming up for the next couple of years. So we'll be looking at some of those uh, ways to uh, hopefully improve this experience that you guys have around that area. Uh, the next bullet here is around copying a license. Um, so, you know, basically our license files are, are locked. I'm pretty sure that's that was one of the issues that uh, uh, DDTC had with uh, their license as well. Um, and, you know, I think like them, we've heard from a number of customers that they want to be able to, or that you guys want to be able to integrate um, that data with your license systems um, and be able to track uh, that within your processes and within your systems. So one of the things we are looking at is uh, trying to remove, you know, possibly removing that restriction on that license file in the future. Uh, but, you know, we'll certainly take some of the lessons learned from uh, our DDTC uh, uh, friends as well and, you know, see what, see what feedback we get from them. Uh, number three here, just talk about the limited admin capabilities. I uh, just wanted to bring up uh, the point that we, we within BIS, within the SnapR self-service, um, we, we have a fairly restricted uh, way for interacting, for, for administrators to uh, interact with the systems. Primarily, um, they have capabilities to create new users, reset passwords, um, change um, uh, addresses, and stuff like that. Uh, but they don't really have access to the work items, and we we you know we keep hearing that um, some organizations want to have or want to grant their system administrators or company administrators the ability to um, uh, have more access to the work items for the possibility of reassigning if somebody's left or um, you know changing permissions for individuals within that organization. So uh, we are looking at at ways to try and improve that customer experience in the future. Uh, number four, we have the license uh, tracking. So currently, um, you can track your license, uh, you know, through SnapR, through Stella. You can call up on the phone, um, you know, and find out the, the status. Oops, sorry. Um, so we're investigating, looking at uh, possible mobile-friendly options in the future, uh, you know, trying to provide ways maybe that you could actually interact with uh, the license uh, through, like, maybe being able to track it, uh, get notifications from SnapR. Um, so, you know, just things that we're thinking about that may help address some of those uh, concerns that you guys have brought up. Um, another issue, I'm going to move down to here to the last bullet, which is uh, the manual data entry. Um, so, you know, so just like DDTC, DDTC has uh, uh, for the DEX uh, application there, they've got an API. Uh, we don't currently have an API uh, that you can interact with. Uh, we, we hear from that, we hear about that, uh, you know, all the time um, at uh, conferences and, and uh, so forth. So again, we just want to let you know that we are here. We do hear you about that. It's on our long range plans, uh, but, you know, more than likely it won't materialize until we go through some modernization effort. So. Uh, well, with that said, you know, it's basically my subset of uh, pain points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I see Mike is over there. I'm going to hand it over to you, Michael. Yeah, no, one of, one of my biggest takeaways from this initial snapshot of user research that we did over the summer was around data and the ability to, to allow the community to do more with data. Um, so I think, I think that's then dovetails really well into into uh, collaborating with DDTC on data sharing. <clears throat> and Karen, I know, I know our shops have been working together. Alex been involved also with that in terms of sharing data. Um, where to start on that conversation? I know we've been doing a, we've been doing a lot with with the technology Snowflake, which is a web based, a cloud based tool that will automate the the data sharing process between us. Yeah, um, you know, really excited about doing more and more in terms of, you know, automating those processes. I think that, you know, I think it's it's fair to say that 
um, we've been uh, just, you know, sort of as a whole government, we've been doing things in really very manual ways. And, you know, that creates, it's time consuming. It's, you know, potentially has errors associated with it. A lot of people have to get involved. And, you know, it, it was really nice to work together with your team to do a proof of concept to, to show how it would work if we were to automate these um, exchanges of data. And, um, and you know, what we're doing is, is, um, is something that, you know, I think all of the CIOs and CTOs and, and, you know, people all over government are trying to, you know, make ways that we can actually share data um, that's streamlined and automated and secure and, and takes into account, um, you know, the privacy impacts and, and all of those things. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And also, um, you know, just to extend it even further, you know, we do a lot of sharing, of course, with, um, uh, with DOD and we do sharing with um, CBP. And so, you know, it's sort of, you can see how it just sort of expands in terms of, you know, making this um, really effective and efficient for, for industry. Um, you know, I can't tell you the number of times, um, and I know Alec, you can probably relate to this, the number of times where there's been delays in, in getting data over to DO, to DITSA and and getting and getting delays, getting it back, and making sure that you get it over to Commerce. I mean, excuse me, over to CBP quickly because you know there's always um, really time sensitive things that need to happen by industry, and and you know we get a lot of I get involved in a lot of those. Um, slips where something hasn't moved um, and something needs to move. And so I'm, I'm really excited about working um, with your team, uh, Mike, on, on um, automating this stuff because all of it just gets so much more complicated when you're trying to do it uh, manually. Yeah, it's funny. I tell the story <laughs> often about how our team came to that final meeting to activate uh, the system and activate the data sharing. And it took 10 minutes for the uh, for the meeting to get organized and people to get there and then five minutes for the for the actual data sharing capability to be, to be activated so we don't really i tell people we don't really have technology problems it's the the challenges that i run into on a frequent basis are the paperwork challenges and and uh in order to set up these data sharing agreements and i think that's what uh, we as a government community are working on streamlining uh, as much as possible to accelerate this data sharing, which then allows us to be more effective in terms of export control uh, mission. So yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it is. It was. It's a ten minutes to get organized in the meeting, five minutes to implement the technology, and how many months to get the interagency security agreement signed all the way up the the you know through you know through the clearance process and everything right to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's one of the that was one of the things that you know kind of started this process here, where you know we we spent months, you know, if not half a year, you know, just trying to get that that interagency agreement, uh, yeah. you know, in, in place and so forth, you know, so that we could share that data in in accordance with that GAO report back in 2019. You know, I mean, they they looked at us and they said, hey, wait, look, you know, DTC, you're doing this, uh, BIS, you're doing the same thing, but you're not sharing between yourselves, you know. So, you know, how how do you go about fixing that problem, you know? So that was one of the, 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 the findings from that, that, you know, really got uh, two of our organizations together to uh, try and solve that that problem. And, you know, these newer technologies are, are going to make that process so much uh, simpler. You know, as you said, five minutes, you know, it, it's there, you know? Um, mm -hmm. we, we don't have that manual process anymore of, uh, you know, you, you throw it over the wall because a lot of times that's what it seems like, right? That you're throwing something over the wall, then somebody over the wall says, hey, I got it, or, you know, or it didn't come over over here, you know, can you send that again, you know? And so we, we tend to kind of go back and forth like that right now, and these newer technologies are going to help us uh, resolve those types of issues. Two quick points I just want to make before we jump into the questions, and I'm excited to jump into the questions because, I mean, we could talk all day about this, but really it's it's for the audience. Um, yeah, one is that this kind of modernization change management wouldn't happen without the executive support of our leadership. And so Andre Mendez, the CIO, uh, has been extremely supportive. Um, uh, the secretary, uh, Mr. Estevez, as well as Mr. Capella, the Deputy Undersecretary, have been extremely supportive. 
um, as well as BIS leadership. So this, you know, being a champion of change is easy, easier in that type of an environment uh, when the culture is supportive of uh, uh, operational excellence being increased here at BIS. So, uh, and you and I, Karen, have shared stories about that, uh, about the challenges that can arise, uh, you know, when you have that and when you don't. Um, Absolutely. Technical and business. So, um, yeah, and I just want to reemphasize uh, that if you want to participate further in BIS's journey, we're building a community of folks to engage with during user research. We got over 100 people to volunteer over the summer and per, and we've engaged with them. Uh, click on the link that uh, that's going to be that Renee, I believe, is going to post in the chat if she hasn't already. So we're and just fill out the form. This is uh, this is to get involved in our community as we're modernizing. So, um, yeah, questions. Is it question yeah, time? Let's do it. Let's, yeah, let's do the questions. Okay, gang. All right, we'll dive in then. Um, but before, I'm gonna, Michael and Karen, I'm going to make you guys wait a second because before we jump into the Q&A, um, we do have the admin business we want to take care of. Um, and the first thing is, um, there is, Wendy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, gang, that there is a survey to fill out. Um, for those of you who are interested and want to bring that up right now, um, we'll put that link in the chat as well um, to make sure that you have that. Um, like when Wendy mentioned, this is something I feedback that is very valuable for census in running these sessions. Um, and I know that we've been working with census now for several years on this. So um, we're happy that any any updates we can get from our audience of ways to make this better. We definitely want to hear from you guys as to how to what would engage you further in these presentations in the future. So um, please make sure that you take the time to fill that out. Um, okay, uh, and again, that link will be going in the chat here just in a couple of seconds. Um, the <laughs> first question, though, actually, I haven't seen it in the chat yet, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm going to prompt everyone. Normally, the questions we get on these webinars, the first one is, if I have a coworker or someone who was not able to attend this presentation, will it be recorded? And I want to reassure everyone that yes, absolutely, this will be recorded. It will be available on Census's website. Um, and then we will also post a link, at least I know on the DDTC website, um, back to the Census website. So lots of ways to find it. Um, this information will be available. It does take a little bit to clean it up, get it presentation ready so we can post it. Um, but in a week or so, we will have this presentation back out and available for everyone. Okay, um, so let's dive in. Um, <coughs> So, Michael, I think this first one I'm going to direct to your crew. So, um, third-party applications is a question. So, um, specifically, folks are asking, is there a way as BIS is making changes to make the new system accessible by these third-party applications, such as an OCR or their own homegrown databases, um, knowing that that, pod, that functionality exists in DEX currently? Yeah, I'll give a reply and then I'll turn it over to, to Annie just to elaborate a little bit on what we've heard during our user research. Uh, and I'm going to caveat all of this with, we are at the beginning of our journey and we haven't identified features that we're going to tackle. We are simply doing user research at this point and trying to build our community. Haven't even, don't even have timelines for you yet. So, um, but I think one of the things that was crystal clear in the initial uh, round of user research that we heard is there is a, a a burgeoning uh, existing third third party community um, that exists out there that we need to we need to um, that is a persona that we're going to address as we go through the design and development process and prototyping process. And um, I, I think that is that is at the heart. So it's it's not just the uh, not just the initial applicant that that we're going to address, but also the third parties that represent a multitude of, of entities um, that engage with with uh, BIS. And uh, Annie, I don't know if you, there's any details around that that you wanted to provide on what you heard or have noticed during our uh, initial round of user research. Yeah, so, um, you know, privacy is far most important to us. So without, you know, revealing too, those sorts yeah. of details, um, what I can speak to is that we definitely have learned and heard from you that there are resources that are being leveraged, providing information that we would like to bring into our experience so that you don't need to be doing any sort of back and forth and we can identify what can we provide in a one-stop shop sort of experience 
so that you can work more efficiently and eliminate any sort of extra work or heavy lifting involved by leveraging other services and resources that might contain information that we can fold into our experience that we're giving you. I think this will manifest itself in terms of role-based capabilities. You know, so as you have different individuals with varying roles uh, in in engaging with BIS, I think that that's something that's becoming uh, apparent so that we'll have to consider in the different personas that we're, we're considering tackling and prioritizing, um, uh, whether it's the website or whether it's SnapR or, yeah. I think, Michael, I think you actually pre-answered a question. So there was actually somebody okay. followed up on that, um, specifically referencing the access groups and decks. So I think they were looking for something similar right there, talking about the roles-based access, exactly the same idea. So following that, yeah. central, that's perfect. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think this question um, is specific for uh, the Stella interface. This is more, I think, directed at Alec. Specifically, they were, they were wondering in the improvements if more contact information has been considered for licensing officers, um, similar to what Elisa provides, um, and there are just any updates planned for that application in general. Yeah, so I think as um, Annie uh, pointed out, you know, that this is something that we're going to be researching, you know, a little bit more as we move forward towards the modern, you know, modernizing our applications. It's not something on, on the current uh, uh, roadmap for what we have in play um, in, in our current legacy platform, uh, but it's something we'll certainly uh, consider for uh, the future. So, you know, certainly make sure that you, you use the uh, contact information that we provided, provide, you know, more information back to us so that we can uh, make sure that that's on our List and, and that we you know prioritize that appropriately. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's a perfect opportunity to say we want you to volunteer. Please tell us the things that are <laughs> please tell yes. us the things like a, yeah. that are popping up in chat. Um, a lot of those questions are coming, right? Like just like, oh yeah, you want to know about this? You want to know about this? Yes. Come join. Yeah, us. yeah. Uh, and Karen, I think there is an opportunity on the DDTC side as well. Somebody was asking about the future uh, user upgrades for registration and licensing for 2023. I think they were looking for more details. I think we also have, as you mentioned, the DEX user group. Yes, we exactly. Encourage people to join exactly. Um, you know, I mean, I think there are there are some things that we're going to try to tackle um, on on our existing um, platform. Um, and I don't have all of the detailed list, but it's certainly something that we can follow up on. Uh, but more, more and more, we're, we're really looking to do, um, you know, to streamline things from the standpoint. Uh, and I think that API is going to go a long way to streamlining, um, you know, the return trip um, for licenses and registrations and so on. And I saw in the chat that there was also a question about, um, you know, other, other documents, you know, sort of post submission documents um, being part of those APIs. And, you know, these are not details that we've actually thought through completely. So we are going to need to do sort of, I think, a session on, you know, what is this new API framework look like? Um, and, and how are we going to, you know, make it um, more usable for for all the different things that we're sending back and forth, and so um, yeah, I, I think that um, there's there's a lot of emphasis um, on greater efficiency um, for our user community for sure at mm -hmm. this point, and there are there are many opportunities for that because by no means um, is the Dex application done. Um, you know, we've got a lot more work to do to make it um, really what it needs to be for this community. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think everybody's feeling very motivated and positive about this collaboration, guys. So we've got a couple questions in the chat. Um, in general, are there just thoughts about consolidating DEX and SNAP R applications into a single application for ITAR and EAR licenses? I feel like that's maybe way down the road maybe that, that is that is no you read my mind i here's the thing karen karen and i talk a lot uh and that wasn't happening two years ago a year ago right um mm -hmm. so baby steps uh the other thing uh we talk a lot about uh servicing our user communities better and so um 
you know, whether it's duplicative reporting or, or whether it's the way that we're asking folks to engage with our applications that we currently have. Um, yeah, I, we talk a lot about how to better serve our, our communities and the businesses and entities that are that are out there. So, uh, Karen, anything you want to add? Yeah, I would I would just say that, um, you know, I think there's ways that we can collaborate, you know, short of doing that. I mean, that's sort of a policy decision, of course, um, as everyone knows, and we're <laughs> um, we're not in that realm, um, but we want to support um, the users as much as we can. And, and the technology, of course, exists that allow us to be able to do that. And so I think, you know, we'll, we'll start to see where there's synergies and opportunities for collaboration and we'll just take it one step at a time and, and, you know, work with this community to make sure that we're doing what we can to make it as efficient as possible. I think the good news is that we're listening to you <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> we want to hear from you. Um, I don't know if it's been that way in the past, but it's that way now. And leading that is Annie and providing tons of context to that is Alec on our side. So perfect. All right. There's always hope, guys. There's springs eternal. Um, okay. So for um again, Michael and Karen, so a user is asking us, um, is there any inform possibility that DDTC or BIS would be accepting um, secure transmission of voluntary disclosures that contain sensitive information? Is that a possibility to do for external users as a, similar to something I think what they're looking for as a form submission index? Well, I can start out by saying that, um, you know, our voluntary disclosures were one of the, one of the, things that we didn't push into DEX um, initially in the first rollout of, of the new system. And so people are currently, you know, emailing those submissions and that just started really um, during the pandemic. Um, and so it's a really big priority for me to get that into DEX so that there would be secure transmission of those. And so it is on our roadmap for 2023. Um, and yeah, so the answer to that is absolutely. We want to get that in, incorporated into the into Dex. And there's already a, an approved form as well. So you know, it's not it's not like there's you know we just have to build build it out and test it and and get people comfortable with it. And for BIS, I don't think we're at that point yet that that I can respond to that question. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Um, actually, and then this one, Karen, I've seen this come in a couple times um, related to voluntary disclosures, because I think when, uh, you were talking about um, the uh, user authentication piece of the updates. Um, specifically, you're asking about digital signatures for applications. Um, would they also apply to other documents such as uh, a voluntary disclosure or a DS83? you know, stuff that isn't a web form currently? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. I mean, the, the requirement um, for the digital cert has been on licenses. And what we'd like to do is have an identity proofing solution for all applications, whether it's a retransfer application, a disclosure, a registration, um, and some way to um, sign it without a, with that authenticated user. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely looking at you know what's the best technology to be using for this purpose, um, and and also recognizing that we want to have you know sort of an easy way for people to uh, transition to to new technology. And so yeah, we're we're absolutely looking at, um, at at all of those types of requirements, both both authentication and signature of things incoming, and also um things outgoing you know that they would be digitally or electronically signed as well mm -hmm. yeah. okay um so karen this question this one just came in i'm i'm hesitant to ask this because it has to do with attachments so the question is specifically are there plans to make the 4294 friendlier for amendments um, amendments require applying a completely new application, keeping track of number of licenses and activities. Um, so it, 
is there a way to make the 4294 easier to update and amend? Yeah, you know, that's a, I, that's a good question. I, do, I don't remember um, really getting questions about the 4294, and I would imagine it would be complicated to amend um, that application. So we're, I, I, I'm going to just say that we're willing to look at look at anything and and we're going to prioritize you know based on okay what's you know what things do we need to focus on most um both for our industry users our internal users and for the security requirements right so these are sort of yeah. the ways that we bucket these things but absolutely uh willing to look at that form okay i think i think a lot of the questions are kind of going down that road gang because i've got another one here uh michael and annie i think this one falls in the same type of um Going forward, um, is it possible to add the case number or a transaction ID to all of the SNAP-R communications? So I think what they're looking for is that link on any sort of system interaction. Um, so some have the, the ID, some do not, um, possibly having the applicant name if possible, depending on multiple users and you're knowing which communication they refer to. Um, is that a possibility going forward? I think I'll echo what uh, Karen said. Almost anything's possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's just a matter of when and and uh, how. So I, but I think again, just to kind of circle back to our focus on user research right now, we want to understand your use cases, um, the business side of what you're trying to do, um, not just how you engage with technology, but the business side of what you're trying to do and why, and then we can creatively figure out some really cool stuff that will meet that needs more effectively than they currently are right now, or that is currently offered even by Dex or out there in the entire community. Um, but I, I gotta say during our, our uh, user research sessions at the BIS um, uh, update conference in June, I was, I was just floored at how many positive comments we got about Dex. And, and I was like, wow, I gotta talk to Karen more about this and, and really follow in her team's wake. So I just wanna congratulate you um, on how well that's gone. And although it's not perfect, right? No, nothing's perfect. Um, I think it's a, it's a real achievement. So we're really excited to be working closely with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it, it absolutely is not perfect. And there's a lot that we're going to be able to learn, um, I think, from this community. And what I want to try to avoid is, um, is, is not getting the same message. I mean, I think that we, we need to have the same message in these different venues. And, you know, in that way, we, we, we do invite um, BIS to participate in the DEX user group because you know it's just a sharing of information. So that what we you know this isn't this isn't a, like a race that we want to that that we want to win. <laughs> the DDTC or BIS wants to win. Like we just we sort of want to make sure that that both of these systems um, and wherever we're able to collaborate that the system uh, that the systems can be supportive to. The industry, which is this community, and and that's that's a really important um, part of um, of my feeling about this is that you know if if you guys come up with great ideas and you send them over to BIS and we don't know about them, um, you know then you know that that's not gonna that's not gonna help sort of the whole ecosystem. And so um, and we also work together um, in in trying to collaborate with DITSA. Um, to make sure that those processes are working well. And one of the things I just want to mention is that, you know, it's been in some ways um, a, a challenge, I think, um, to get these industry-facing uh, tracking systems all in sync. Um, and that's something that um, that BIS and state need to get with DITSA to, to talk about, you know, how do we make sure that we all have the same information so that these these tracking UIs are basically you know, updated and and provide great information to people. And um, yeah, because, you know, Elisa and Dex are not the same. Um, you know, there's there's more current information, um, just like in the BIS case, there's, there's more information in Elisa because when it's over there, they're updating it and we're not always getting all of the same information. So I think that's another area where, um, where we'll work together to work with DITSA to, to make these processes work better for industry. 
Excellent. All right, and I think that's a pretty excellent sum up of the of the conversation today, Karen. Thank you. Um, and I say that specifically. I know there are a lot of other questions out there in the chat right now, gang. Um, I'm noticing a lot of them are focused on, ooh, you know, can Snap R do X or is this coming? Um, uh, it's you know, going. Can we, right? Can that we make going. this change <laughs> in Dex? Can we make this update to the website? Like. All of those things, we will refer back to that link that was posted out there earlier. So like Michael, Annie, and Alec have been talking about, you know, make sure you participate in that conversation with BIS, be a part of that group, volunteer, bring that voice to that conversation. We want to hear from you. That would be wonderful. And the same thing again for the, the DEX user group for 2023. Um, make sure you are looking at the website on ddtc make sure you sign up to volunteer for that if you want to have a say in where those registration and licensing updates are going to come from um, we definitely want to hear from you the user community have you guys help make us make this better um, and make it work better for everybody so we encourage it all right and i think with the minute and a half we have left wendy i think i'm going to turn it back over to you for the closeout. Okay, great. Um, this has been an excellent webinar. I just have four quick little summary summary um, comments. I um, certainly want to thank our presenters um, from the State Department and um, presenters from the BIS, our sister agency, for this collaborative effort here today. This was a great webinar. We had over 700 um, on the call today, so um, good participation. So I know we're going to have a high response rate with the evaluations. We're a statistical agency, so we collect data. So we're looking forward to hearing, hearing your feedback. And just wanted to mention that um, the link has been placed in the chat where you can obtain the presentation, recording, and transcript within about a seven to ten business days following today. So once again, thank you and please visit our Census Academy site for future outreach events um, that may be of interest to you and, and your um, businesses. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. This concludes the webinar. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at this time.